Okay, we'll uh, we'll get going, and if people straggle on in, we'll we'll let them in. So, I guess first and foremost, I hope everyone's doing well and uh, are safe, and continuing to kind of kind of win the weight and and strive as we make our way through uh, the external kind of things that are happening in our world. So, um, so what my plan is tonight here is is I'm I'm going to kind of go through um, developing mentality and in, in your scheme. And to tie it into our first webinar, you know how we talked about stress and we talked about those aspects. Now we're really trying to make a connection into how do we actually manage that stress? So how do we build our identity to, to do so? So there's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind before we get going and, and I kind of go through the next half an hour and, and tell you how I approach things with athletes in any sport and, and try and make it specific to golf. But the two main questions I, I want you to think about as we make our way through um, is what is your identity as a player? So in other words, what are you about? Okay, and I, I want you to be careful because an easy answer for a young athlete is to say things like I'm about making birdies and, and I'm about being aggressive and you know, I'm about shooting this type of score and I, I want you to try and move away from that. And, and then the second part of that is I want you to think about is what type of mental skills do you use to reiterate your identity? So what I mean by that is, is that what we want to make sure that we're doing, I don't know how we're doing that, that again here so when I say that what I want what I want us to do is I want us to make sure that that we're, we're thinking a little bit more than just ego and we're thinking a little bit more than just final outcome so you know scheme and identity are a huge thing and and for young athletes that's hard because we, we haven't we haven't gained a whole lot of experience we're still trying to mature we're still, still trying to figure out the world you know school relationships stuff like that uh, all those things play a big part into our emotional management. Um, how we can use mental skills to help us with our identity and our scheme. And then finally, you know, because this type of development is, is difficult, I, I want you to keep in mind, so is technical. And, and I always say to my athletes, you know, mental skills usually comes in later in life and it's hard. And, and to answer the questions like what type of identity are you as a player? What are you about? Those are hard questions. And, and I'm not expecting you maybe not maybe to know them right now. And, and so, but when you first started swinging a golf club, it was very difficult. The difference between then and now is we usually start physical practicing when we're three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, and we don't know any better. And, and now we know a little bit better. And so when things are a little bit more difficult, become stressful, we disengage, we distract, or we are task oriented. So I urge you to be task oriented and I urge you to make sure that you're, you're thinking a little bit outside the box as we go through these, these couple ideas here and, and so forth. So um, I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. So standards, I, I think it's pretty safe to say when we think about a standard of excellence, you know, athletes like Serena Williams and Michael Phelps and Tiger Woods comes to mind. I think as young athletes, we get, tend to get caught up in that standard of excellence. And, and what I mean by that is it's great to, to, to look at Tiger Woods as a role model, but he, he's probably not everybody's typical person that they should model their game after. And, and when we think about athletes like, like Serena and Michael Phelps and, you know, in the hockey world, Sidney Crosby and, and Tiger Woods, they're outliers. They're, they're the exception to the rule. And why I'm saying that is because as young athletes, if we set Tiger Woods as our, as our standard of excellence, we're probably going to induce a lot more anxiety and a lot more stress because that type of standard is very hard to live up to. And so what we want to make sure we're doing is we want to make sure we set a standard for ourselves. And that's where our identity and our scheme comes in. I heard a great quote on a podcast about, about junior development. And, and the quote was, until they pay you for the score you shoot, it's not, or until they pay you for what you shoot, it's not about the score. And I, and I can't, like, that is so true. And, and part of identity and part of scheme is to dig a little bit deeper into what we're trying to, to establish and, and identifying, you know, things that we can do to make ourselves better in, in the sense of that it's not just about the score and it's not just about what we see on TV. There's an internal process. And, and I think it's really important that, that we have those standards we set for ourselves or else the anxiety is going to be induced because we can never live up to standards that someone else has set. It is hard in today's society between social media, uh, 
coaches, recruiting, everything that's out there, it is very difficult to be very internal because there's so many things externally that are pulling for your attention. And part of this process, part of developing this scheme is to develop how good you can be. And that's what my job is. My job for athletes and teams that I work with is get them to believe how good they are. So emotional intelligence, their scheme, their identity, their mental skills all play a huge part of that. And if you remember, and I'll show the slide here in a little bit, but in that moment of stress and in that moment of crisis, how are we going to react? Well, if we've set a standard that's way out here and is an outlier, of course it's gonna create more anxiety. Of course it's gonna induce, induce more stress for us. Because we, there is not going to be in a long while another player like Tiger Woods. And I think what's really easy for us to kind of kind of set these standards of these athletes, but you have to set standards for yourself. And the one thing I know, if there's 40 of us on here right now, the one thing I do know is that there's 40 different perceptions and 40 different routes to success. And not all of them are easy. And so developing your identity and developing your scheme is really, is really important. And all of that kind of creates that standard, that, that standard of play and, and your thought patterns around that standard of play. The highest level, emotional intelligence is a differentiator. I had an athlete today that, that I work with and, and, and their feedback and their journal entry was, you question why, where they are, where the, why she is where she is, is because of her, her ability to be aware and understand what's happening in her, her own, not her teammates, but in her own performance profile. And, and it, was just, it was just amazing. And, and I, I, I really believe that that belief that belief in her ability in the long run is going to outweigh maybe someone who's who shot to the top right away. Right. And, and I think when we talk about talent, talent is great, but somehow you have to learn how to manage the distractions and that distractions. One of our biggest distractions are, is ourselves. And, and we have to learn how to do that. And if we can do that, then all of a sudden we become efficient athletes, we become effective. And, and of course we, we can perform a little bit better. And, and so it, it's really important when we talk about these things is to make sure that we are, we are identifying things that are part of our internal process and, and how we work and, and not how other people work. And I can't stress that enough. And, and although it's hard and we want those outcomes, I get it. Hey, I like winning just as, not, just as much as the next person. But at the end of the day, it's about your route to success. And, and there, there's no way, there's no way around that. So Hopefully the next few slides kind of give you that route and kind of give you that idea of, of how I look at it and, and how I kind of uh, adopt it with my athletes and stuff like that. So, so what is a scheme? You know, a scheme is really comes down to four main areas. And if you remember back last time we talked about software and hardware and stuff like that, really the four big ones is how you manage yourself. And, and so understanding your impact and knowing your beliefs and taking conscious activity actions towards those things right uh, how you how you impact your your own mentality is is something that's often overlooked and if you learn how to manage yourself then you create trust and i'm not talking about trust uh, i'm talking about trust in two ways i'm talking about trust in yourself and trust if if you have a caddy or or maybe it's your parents or whatever and trust is earned and deserved and and you're the person that has to extend it first usually right and, and i think it's really important if we're learning how to trust ourselves, then, then we have to give ourselves a little bit of the, a break at times as well. Um, or else you're, you're going to set, once again, that standard way too high that you can never reach. Third part is how you paint the picture. How do you see yourself as you go through the process? And, and, and you have to love the process. Okay? What images will foster those types of emotions? And then finally, how do we embrace adversity? And this is a big one. Golf is full of mistakes. Golf is full of setbacks. How do we reset and reframe ourselves? I truly believe under every emotion, there's some type of energy. And so if we can direct that energy, whether it's negative or positive, that's the key to resetting. So if we're upset about a shot, how do we channel that energy so that we don't hit two or three more bad shots? And that's, that's all how we're thinking and what we're saying to ourselves. And once again, it's an internal process, right? And, and I think it's really important. I shared this last time. At the end of the day, we're trying to create that space. We're trying to create this area right here. Because things will happen, they're going to generate an emotion, and then we need that space, and then we can go back to performing. If things are really good, you're hitting the ball really well, creating good emotions, usually we just ride it out, and, and it just keeps continuing, and you stay out of your own way. It's just, it's just natural. But a lot of the time, 
we're always not as effective as we want to be. So that's where our mental skills really come into place. How do you get up in the morning and, and how, do you, how do you make sure your, your good days and bad days, there's not much of a gap? And I would presume like a lot of youth athletes who are trying to compete, our good days are, are good and then our bad days are really bad. And I would argue why your bad days and why there's such a big gap between those two areas is because you're not using this space very well. And the second part of that is, is that you don't know what you're about. And so when that stress comes and it's all on you, what are you going to do? What are you going to think about? And, and that's where that good self-talk and those good mental skills come in, right? Uh, something that I talk about is, is the need for emotional intelligence, right? I think a lot of the time on the golf course, we spend a lot of time worrying. And, and there is a great little thing here. 40% of the things we worry about never occur. 30% of the things we worry about happen in the past and more likely will never happen again. 12% is worry about health. 10% of the worry is on, on petty things like what others think. So maybe it's playing partners. And then finally, 8% is on legitimate concerns that needs to be managed. If you look at all this and it kind of goes back to that whole idea, that whole idea about, about stress and distracting and disengaging, 8% is where we need to be task oriented. And 8% is knowing what we're about to, to, to go over. Because the, this other part here, the 40, 30, 12, 10, are things that are way outside of our control, right? And so if you really think about it, if you think about where do you spend most of your time worrying, and most of our athletes, find out. most of our athletes spend a lot of our time worrying about things we can't control. Okay. Right? And so we need to make sure, oh, I'm just gonna ask everyone just to kind of mute themselves here. I'm getting some, some back, if you don't mind. Chat to this guy and say, All right, here we go. So with that said, when we're emotionally aware, we do a really good job of understanding, you know, a lot of this stuff is not gonna happen. So we, we really need to narrow on these types of things, right? And some of these things might be things like, hey, how am I gonna play tomorrow? Once again, that can be managed. You may not be 100%, but how do you turn a 50 into a 60%? That's something that's manageable. It's a legitimate concern, right? But what your playing partners are gonna shoot, that's not, that has, you have no control over that type of thing. And, and so driving yourself into the areas that you can control is a huge thing. And, and, it, and it's something that we gotta make sure that we're, we're looking at, okay? So with that said, when we talk about identity and we talk about, about style, you know, there's kind of three aspects, your identity, your beliefs, and your style of play. And everybody sitting in this room is different. Is there, is there common themes? Absolutely. Is there certain things, you know, whether you hit the ball far or whether you're a good putter or a short game or, you know, you get up and down from anywhere, you know, there's certain things that play a part in our emotional management and in our confidence, right? And so when I talk about these types of things, I, I'm really talking at what is identity? Identity is how you identify as a player. So these are non-negotiables. What are things that you're going to do, right? Beliefs, what beliefs shape your identity? We all have different beliefs of how the game should be played. And, and that's in any sport, right? That's, that's from coaches, from players. We all have different beliefs. What is your belief? How should the game be played? And then your style of play, how do you get around the course, right? And these are huge questions. And, and if you can start chipping away at these types of things, you're starting to form that, that fallback of when things are tough. So you've hit it out of bounds. Okay, what type of player am I, right? What is something I have to do? I have to get the next one on the fairway, right? I, I maybe I can make bogey, double bogey at worst, but what's that internal process that's going through your mind, right? So furthermore, what is athletic identity? Well. It, there's certain things that happen to you in your past that shape, right? There's your athletic scheme. So how you feel about yourself as an athlete, how you identify as an athlete, and then overall your judgment you have about your athlete. At the end of the day, when we ask these questions and we start shaping this idea, the goal is, is that at the highest stress or pressure, you need to have a sense of who you are as an athlete. And if you have nothing, if you can't think of anything when that big putt comes or when you're on the final tee or on the first tee, it's really hard to evaluate yourself because you're, you're looking at just the outcome, right? So let's say you walk up to the first tee of a tournament 
and you're really nervous and you're really, you know, whether you're high anxiety or, you know, you're just sweating and, and stuff like that, you get on the first tee, you hit it down the middle. It, it, it tends to sometimes give you that false sense of, oh, I've got this. And then the next time comes and you hit it OB and then all of a sudden you go straight to the negative about, well, something's wrong with my driver or something's wrong with my swing, right? That's because of that standard and you don't know what you're about, right? It is so important that you let your internal process drive everything, right? So something I use with a lot of my athletes, I, I call it a, it's kind of, kind of a gold medal profile. So what are these, what are my keys technically, mentally, off course and in my environment, right? It could be, your, when I talk about environment, it could be what someone's telling or talking to you about, right? It, it could be something for you that, that you want your parents to say to you, right? Off course, maybe it's something to do with a meal or nutrition or whatever the case may be. Mental and then technical, of course, is, is your swing. There's, there's lots of conversation about, like, do I have a swing thought? You know, I, it's, it's really up to the athlete in my mind. If you do have a swing thought while you play, make sure it's one or two thoughts. You know, I, I think for the majority of the athletes and golfers I work with, I want them thinking target. But some of us are, are highly analytical. So when we're highly analytical, don't fight it learn how to streamline it. And what I mean by that is don't say, well, I can't have any swing thoughts. That's false. You can have swing thoughts, but let's try and minimize them to, to maybe one or two, right? And, and that's part of that emotional intelligence and self-awareness. If you're a highly analytical person, you're probably going to have a swing thought when you're over the ball. So let's make sure it's the right type of swing thought instead of just trying to suppress it and say, I can't do that, right? And, and so that goes to kind of that idea about how you develop your identity and how you develop kind of your, your scheme as an athlete. One of the things, uh, and this is just kind of a, uh, an example of something that I use with athletes is at the end of a, a round or a game or whatever the case may be is they rank their preparation level. Sorry. So they rank their preparation level, and this is at the end of a round. They rank their pregame preparation. They rank their confidence level. They rank how emotionally they are. They rank their – they have some comments on their emotional stability. Uh, I'll talk more about self-talk here in a minute, but, but what is their self-talk plan? And what was their I, – I use a lot of statements like I am and I will. Um, divine your word and your game in five words. And then they rank their focus level. And then, and then how do we maintain that focus? So this is kind of a journal entry and an example. And why I'm showing it to you here is because this type of entry is going to help develop your scheme. So what's going to happen is if you play 20 rounds, you're going to start noticing same words. Well, those same words are going to perpetuate performance. Hey, I was assertive, right? I, sh I was calm. I was relaxed. I was poised. You're going to start finding these things out. And I'm an advocate that words perpetuate performance. So, so the more, the better self-talk we can get, the better internal dialogue we can get, the more important it's going to be. And, and this all shapes kind of your, your identity and your, and your scheme. And, and so when you have those types of words, you can start establishing your mental skills. And, and kind of three levels of mental skills is your basic, your preparation, your performance. And, and I kind of mentioned this the last day, at the, at the top of everything, we want to be able to focus and concentrate. We're, it's all about priming our focus. You don't have to go into a golf round and focus your energy for five hours. You have to know how to prime your focus for that shot. So good self-talk, good pre-shot routine, knowing what you're about, right? All those types of things. And, and if we can do that, then we're managing our anxiety and managing our emotions. How we usually manage those things is through breathing. That takes us down to our preparation skills, our imagery, our visualization, our self-talk, our meditation, our mindfulness, and then your basic skills, right? attitude, motivation, what are your goals and your commitment areas and, and your people skills as well. All those things are, are important. So the one thing I want to make sure is, is if let's say if you're having a really a tough day with your attitude, right? Maybe something happened at school. Uh, maybe you had an argument with your parents, whatever the case may be, it's going to play a part. And I think what happens is a lot of athletes have the, maybe an attitude issue on that day. And then they try and just shoot up to this focus and concentration. And that's not how it works. If you're, have, if you're inefficient in these types of things, your motivation and attitude, that's where these things become really important. <clears throat> there is no athlete out there 
that, that has a hundred percent motivation every day. You know, there's a great documentary on Netflix with Usain Bolt. He talks about, you know, it is so hard when my friends go out at night and I can't because I'm preparing for, for the Olympics, right? We're not sitting here and saying that, that it has to be an absolute, but what we are sitting here is if, if your attitude and motivation and you're questioning your goals and your commitment, if it's like at a three out of 10, this area can get you to a five out of 10 and also push you to a six or a seven. And if you're doing that, you know, I, I think if, if you have some belief in yourself and, a, and belief in your, in your swing, you can get the job done without feeling optimal that day. Right. And, and I, I, I truly believe that. And I, I think it starts with knowing what you're about and then playing your self-talk and, and your, your self-talk and your visualization and your mindfulness into that. Uh, the last thing I want to mention here, just on preparation skills, if you don't have a go-to breathing routine, you need one. One that you can fall back that you know, like the back of your hand. It is one of the most important things in moments of stress. And, and not, not, not searching for that, but knowing automatically, that's the routine I'm going to go into. When, and and you, can, you can toy with different routines through a tournament, but when that big tournament comes, you need to make sure you know what your breathing technique is. Because that's going to control a whole lot of your emotions and your anxiety. And I can't stress that enough. So how do we take our identity and put it into our preparation? Well, there's four phases in my mind. Number one is the night before. Number two is your pre-round. So that's maybe one to two hours. Uh, then your in-round plan and then your post-round plan. And I'm going to take you through a cup, an example. The end of the day, no matter where you're at, night before, pre-round, in-round, post-round, it's all about communication. And most importantly, how you talk to yourself about yourself. And the second most important thing about communication is how you talk about uh, how you talk to others about yourself. Right. And, and so communication is a big thing for me. And so where does it start? Well, number one, and, and I know this is a little bit in the sense of it, it's not golf, but I I've shown this to a lot of teams that I work with and, and stuff like that, but having a mission and, and this is Alabama's football's mission and, and just great words, right? Like our special teams are lethal weapons. Every position ends in a kick, super mentality, you know, our story, sniper mentality, one shot, one kill, right? Our offense dominates the trenches with rage and brutality. We are, we are a freight train that is unstoppable. Um, you know, just, I am an advocate of communication. I'm an advocate for words. And, and this does a great job of, of creating that mission. And so something you can do is you know what's your mission on par threes and and i know in a perfect world you would know the course and i understand in junior golf you don't always know the course you're going into but what's your fallback you know our par threes are something you you middle of the greens and and two putts and if you make a putt great but what is your mission right uh, i would presume for a lot of players on par fives that's where you're going to have that sniper mentality right and and so if you have that mission going into the round once again, you have words and, and our thoughts run our lives. And so if you have that mission, hey, this is what I'm gonna do on part threes and part fours. And if it doesn't go that way, I'm gonna have to adapt and find another way to get the job done. That's the type of internal dialogue we want. But what usually happens is you miss that green on a part three and that was the plan. Now it's plan B and you're not too sure because you don't know what to fall back on. Hey, I, I can get up and down because that's the type of game I am. That's part of my beliefs. I believe in players who get up and down. That's the type of internal process that we want. So it starts with your mission the night before. Okay. Uh, you know, and this kind of goes back to par threes, visualizing your mission. I'm going to compete for birdies. Make sure I have good club selection, right? Par four is middle of the greens, good reads on my putts, make some birdies. I'm not a huge birdie person on par fours, but I know some people are, right? Par fives, be assertive. Make sure I put the ball in play off the tee. If I can get the ball in play off the tee, I'm going to set myself up really good for some of those other athletes or some of the athletes that I've worked together for a few years, especially some of the golfers I've worked with, you know, we establish a little bit more. So then you all of a sudden break your par fours into maybe sections of three and you find out, you know, if it's a 325 yard dog leg, that's birdieable. Now it's a little bit different mission in that, in that section, but you know, you can do a whole lot of things with this and this by no means is, is, is a definite, I mean, you could have the first three holes, what's your mission? The first six holes, what's your mission? And that kind of goes back to that emotional intelligence about knowing how you focus and knowing where you want to take your self-awareness and, and your assessments and stuff like that. 
Second part of that is you can start visualizing that statement, right? Making a good 20 foot putt. That's a great night before visualization. Getting onto a par three tee box and pulling out the club and saying, I have the right club. That's a great visualization, right? Uh, this is, I, I showed this example a few times, but this is, you know, a great example of night before. I know this is every day, but these are some hints that you can use, you know, uh, visualize what it feels like to play confidently. Uh, re five things that you're good at. This goes back to your identity, right? Visualize a skill you're working on, right? So, you know, I, one thing I like to do with, with athletes I work with is we create a monthly calendar and we'll have something that they can fall back on on every night. And, and so if it turns out to be an off night, you know, uh, something, a skill I'm working on, maybe it's, maybe it's a lob shot. Maybe I'm trying to get, you know, further back on my, further back on my, um, on my swing or, or takeaway or whatever the case may be, but there's lots of good areas that we can use here. Okay. Um, next part is putting it to work your pre round preparation. So what is your task? So when you get up in the morning, what is your task that day? What are you trying to do? So look for specific scenarios on the course for you to be successful. How efficient are you, right? If you've just been battling a cold all week and you feel like you're a four out of 10, you're probably not going to go out and shoot 65. You might, but with the right type of mentality. So be aware of how you feel in the morning and then train your mind to be able to be in the moment, right? See yourself perform the day with the game that you have, right? Take a few minutes to take a breath and paint the picture for the day. Right. I know I, that same podcast they talked about on the PGA tour, 80% or five, the 80% of a player's annual income is from five tournaments, five tournaments. So once again, you got to love the process here. Right. And then finally visualize key scenarios that you are in. Right. The biggest thing is to control absolute focus for 30 to 40 second shots. Right. And I'm going to get into that more 40 seconds is quite long, but we can work with that. Uh, so on the course, show your strengths. Be more of who you are, not more than you are. I think sometimes when pressure hits, we start trying to do too much. Uh, go back to what you're supposed to be doing, right? Um, own the now, right? I think there's there's a lot of good things to, to be present, right? Not to be urgent, but to make sure that you're present. And then yearn to earn. Every time we get to go on a golf course, there's an opportunity to learn. And that's a great growth mindset. And we need to make sure we have that, okay? In round, I kind of mentioned this, be present, not perfect, right? Between shots, move to other areas of life, right? Discuss views, be aware of your breathing and pace of walk. Uh, something I use with a lot of my golfers is to use a stress ball or a tennis ball or whatever the case may be, but have something. I, I'm an advocate to get away from it for a little bit while you're walking and then learning how to prime yourself, right? Make sure you have good structured self-talk in the round. I am, I will. And then your pre-shot routine, and I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit, okay? So what is a pre-shot routine? So, so timing is everything in your pre-shot routine. And, and if, you watch, if you watch a live tournament, you know, pros are pretty good, and they're pretty bang on all the time, right? And, and so I'm always, you know, I, I've had higher than 25 seconds. I've had lower than 20 seconds. I mean, it, it depends on the individual. If you're a highly analytical person, then it's going to probably take you just a few seconds longer to, to find your strategic thought pattern and, and, and use that in your play. So, but approach the ball, put your bag down, assess wind, distance, lie. That takes about five seconds. Then I'm an advocate to paint the picture of the shot. So you're standing behind the ball, you're, you're, you're facing your target and, and you're going to visualize that shot and, and, Take a practice swing, one practice swing with purpose, right? And, and I understand, hey, this is wide open. You know, some people like to take three. I, I'm just saying what I, the starting point, right? I'm a huge advocate to visualize the shot with some breathing as opposed to taking practice swings, right? Make sure you have a strong self-talk. So your I am, I am, I will approach the ball, get into your breathing for about three seconds. That's where that, that go-to breathing hits your shot and then finish. And I'm a huge fan of holding it for seven seconds, taking a breath and assessing it, not based on the outcome. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, right? So after the shot, So after the shot, what we want to make sure is, is that we're holding it. And, and I always say, you know, 
whether it's 30 after you hit the shots and you've held it and, and, and you're in that resetting, whether it's a great shot or whether it's an awful shot, make sure you're resetting. And, and like I said before, when it's a great shot, we tend to hang on to that great moment a little longer. When it's a bad shot, we're probably a little bit harder on ourselves and create anxiety, right? So there's a, there's a key out there of 30, 30 seconds good or 30 seconds bad, no matter what, in 30 seconds, it's over. And, and so that's where you, your first step to move on, right? Resetting for us is important because it helps us manage our emotions through highs and lows, right? Take a breath to start it all over again, right? The Chicago Cubs, when they won the 2016 World Series, they, they talked about flushing it, good and bad, flush the moment and move forward, okay? Treat each shot differently with the type of player you are as allows us to be present, okay? At the end of the round, take a few minutes to review your process on each shot, okay? This drives your internal process and your identity as a player because it's your preparation being evaluated, not your score, right? So if you're, you know, through, through the round, if you're looking at how you assess the situation, that's digging into the process that you can control. The shot you hit, you could hit a great shot and get a terrible bounce off of a sprinkler head right? So getting into your process is so important and evaluating your round based on your process, based on, Hey, did I manage my, did I manage my emotions? Did I use a good pre-shot routine? When things got tough, did I speed up or did I slow down or did I just abolish my pre-shot routine altogether? Right. And then last thing is also write down words that create your word sketch, write down things that you were feeling through the round, nervous, anxious, whatever the case may be. Okay. That helps, that helps and speaks to how you create the night before and for your mentality and so forth, okay? Oops. Sorry. At the end of the day, you know, what are we trying to do? We're trying to build identity. So, you know, how did you contribute to the missions on your part threes, part four, part fives? You could go out and say you shoot a score you didn't want to shoot. Don't get hung up on the score. Go back and look at what your identity, the type of player you are, and I guarantee you there's, there's a half a dozen points between 18 holes of golf that you showed your identity. Write it down and then use that as part of your visualization for the next day, for the next round and, and, and the night before and so forth, okay? The end of the day, when we look at this presentation, Okay, just ask yourself, and no one needs to answer this, but just ask yourself, what happens if you invest in this approach? If you take time to build into your internal process, what does that do for the external distractions that might happen to you, right? And, and so hopefully I've given you something to think about. Um, I'm kind of going to open it up here for, for some questions. I, I'm going to just show you something that I've put together here. Um, Kind of as a last slide. So I've sent this out to everyone too. I, I'm doing a, a bit of a six week kind of with this hiatus, you know, finding success in, seclu in seclusion. Um, so it's a six week mental skills journey um, that we're going to kind of embark on. Uh, you know, this would be the next step if, if some of the stuff that I talked about um, kind of interested you. and. Um, you know, we're going to have weekly webinars and, and weekly mental skills, journal entries and, and stuff like that. And in an effort that why it's six weeks is, is hopefully by that time we're, we're getting into a little bit more of a normal routine and, and normal life and, and playing maybe some tournaments and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if we're not doing that, then you still have six weeks into your mental performance and stuff like that. So uh, that's kind of where I'm going. So. That's all I had tonight. I, uh, I appreciate everyone popping in and, and I'm gonna kind of open it up here for, for some questions and stuff like that. So if you have questions, please take a few minutes and just put them in the chat and we'll go from there.
proper breathing technique, you know, the one I, I kind of use with a lot of my clients is, is, is one from the Navy SEALs because it's about 30 seconds. It's, it's really quick. And, and so in, in the face of competition, it's a good go back to. Um, but, you know, there's lots on like headspace and, and stuff like that. But you got to keep in mind, if you're using block breathing, so say you're inhaling for six, holding uh, for six, exhaling for six, you need something quicker than that, unless you're going to use that in the round. And, and so with that breathing, I want to make sure, um, you know, we have something that we can integrate into, into what we're doing on, on our shots. And so it's a quick four or five seconds so that we can release the tension in our muscles and, and, and kind of pull the trigger, so to speak, and hit the shot that we want to shot, want, want to hit. So, um, you know, if, if you're just starting and you're looking for breathing techniques, what I would do is I would make sure that just YouTube it. Um, there's some in that, in the workbook that I sent you as well, and just start experimenting. Uh, it's the same as your golf swing. And, and, you know, when you're looking for a new set of irons, you, you, you start searching and, and this is no different. So, um, will managing stress help you make smarter and more thought out decisions? Yes. Whether you know it or not, when even a, an ounce of stress, um, create some type of, of barrier in our, in ourselves. Right. I, I worked with an individual and, and was caddying for him one time and, and hit the ball quite a ways and he hit it way left off the tee. We get up into the trees and, and, and it's a par five. And he's like, you know, I can probably hook it around that tree and, and kind of skip it over that bunker and get on the green in two. And, and I said to him, I said, well, what happens if you just punch it out? You're a hundred and punch it out this way. And you're 125 yards from the green hit a wedge in, make birdie that way. And, and so, you know, smart guy, but as soon as he got into those trees, everything stopped. So if, if we don't manage our stress, you're, you're probably gonna, you're probably gonna miss out on some key decisions that, that, that could help you out in a round. Right. And, and at the highest level, one or two shots makes a big difference. And, and I truly believe that. So to kind of round it, round it out, Stress does weird things to us, whether we know it or not. In most young athletes, uh, male athletes, stress happens to us when we're, we get angry. And if we're angry, our muscles are automatically going to go tense. And so if we're not learning how to do that, then we're probably not going to make the best decisions, right? Well, I can hit it over that water now, right? And, and so you just have to be aware of it and you have to manage it. Uh, what are some strategies you, I'd recommend to handle pressure before and during a big event? Breathing yoga in the morning, breathing, mindfulness, right? If you're playing in a tournament, there's nothing wrong with getting up in the morning and, and doing, you know, a 20 minute yoga session or a 20 minute mindfulness session. You can go on Headspace, you can go on YouTube. There's a ton out there that I use just based off of those. Uh, you can use your own and, and time your own. Uh, but like I said, breathing is everything because breathing is gonna lead you into your self-talk and your visualization. Uh, how long should you visualize before a tournament around? Uh, it's the same as kind of, you know, do you go to a tournament and just play or do you work on your game through the week and through the summer? This is no different. Your, your visualization is, is the same thing. I mean, if right now my individual athletes are, we're doing a five day visualization plan right now. So they have two days, they have, they have two days off Saturdays and Sundays, but then Monday through Friday, they're, they're doing a visualization project or, or whatever the case may be. Great questions. Is there any more? You can speak up too if you want. You don't have to type it in the chat. So one question is, what do you do when you, when you like the feeling of emotion and hold on to it for a long time? I would presume that's when you don't like, or you, when you do like the feeling of emotion. Can you just clarify that, Dwayne, and then I'll come back to you. Sorry. Um, I have no idea when golf courses in Alberta are going to open. So when you do like the feeling, Dwayne, and you want to hold on to that feeling, 
Okay. So if one of the things that, that helps athletes is, is we want to feel good. And when we feel good, so think about when you're in a hot streak and things are just going really well, you tend to forget about everything. And, and so when you have those feelings and you know what type of feelings you want to feel, you, you have to visualize those types of feelings again. And, and you have to direct your focus on trying to create that. And, and at times, yes, it's like playing a trick on your brain. And, it, and it's a way of finding out, hey, can I really make this work for myself? And can I really make sure that I'm doing the best that I can in the sense of, hey, I got to feel that way. You know, the one thing about positive emotions is that they don't last for as long as negative emotions do. Why that, you know, there's a lot of research, um, brain, brain waves, amygdala, stuff like that, that I'm not going to get into. Um, but at the end of the day, positive emotions are a lot harder to hold on to than negative emotions. Just think of when you're mad at a friend, right? You could be mad at that friend for a very long time, as opposed to when you're very happy for a friend or happy with a friend, it, it kind of goes by the wayside in 24 hours. So your job is to mentally kind of rehearse those times where you feel really good and try and bring them back into, into kind of your identity and your scheme. Hey, when I'm playing my best, I'm, I'm relaxed. I'm decisive, right? And, and use those types of words to help perpetuate performance and, and stuff like that. So, uh, great question. Uh, what schedules are better long-term or short-term schedules to increase performance? Um, you know, I, I think when, when, I mean, and this is more a personal philosophy and there's tons of coaches out there that, that would agree and maybe disagree. Um, you know, I, I think I, Let's say if you're a, if you're a player that, that wants a scholarship, that, that's a great kind of one or two year plan. But the more important plan right now is, is kind of your week to week plan. And, and so to increase performance, your, your short term plan is, is really important because what are you doing every day to get better? How are you winning the day? You know, right now, how are you winning the winning the weight? How are you going to find success in this seclusion? And, and I think that's what's important. And I think there's a lot of people with long term plans but not a lot of people who invest in the, sh in the, in their short term plan. And what can I do right now today? And, and so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so how do you let go of shots, forget it and move on? What are some strategies? You know, I, that goes back to that resetting, right? So if you go back, if you hold that shot, it's a bad shot. Let's say it, it's going way left, you know, exact what you want to do exactly like right at that moment is to go back to your preparation. Hey, I assessed the shot correctly. I assessed the win correctly. I love my pre-shot routine. I just didn't hit the shot that I wanted. Right. And, and have that type of emotional uh, kind of management as opposed to all oh, this is, I can't believe I hit it there. I hit it in the water and going that route, go back to the, your whole process, your whole internal thing that you could control. Did you make a good decision? If you didn't, what can you do the next time? And that's all happening in that kind of that moment, that mental skill space, right? And, and so one of the strategies is to base your shots more on than just, just outcome. And at the end of the round, I would be willing to bet your outcome was real or your process was really good, but we don't spend enough time investing in a process because we're so outcome based, right? And it goes back to that standard that we set for ourselves and we want to play really, really well scale it back, tap the brakes and move back into the, Hey, I assessed it. Well, I, I, I did a good pre-shot. I was relaxed. I didn't hit the shot. Here's what I'm going to have to do now. Right. And so that takes into self-talk visualization and a little bit of breathing. And those are your, those, those three strategies are your go-to everywhere. And those help you flush those moments, forget it in 30 seconds and stuff like that. If you have a bad attitude on the golf course, how do you work on it off the course? Uh, great question. You know, I think one of the things about, you know, I don't know if it's a bad attitude as much as it is maybe a, a perfectionist attitude. And, and, and I think one of the big things that, that is to, how are you going to set standards when you miss hit a shot? And, and so let's say, you know, if you, if you hit, you know, give yourself a break and go into a round and say, you know what, I'm allowed to miss hit 20, bad, 20 shots today. And, and that's going to change your mentality a little bit because once you hit that bad shot, it's going to be like, okay, well, what do I do now? I got to go on to the next one and hit that shot. Right. And, and I think, you know, one of the things about attitude is, is, and I, I, I might sound like a broken record, but your mindfulness and your breathing 
whether you're 10 years old, 12 years old, 20 years old, it does wonders for us from an attitude point of view. And I can't stress that enough. So, you know, how you work on it off the course is, is, is get into a mindfulness program and, and start seeing yourself perform even in the face of those bad shots and even in the face of that bad attitude. Uh, what is the best way to make yourself determine get better? Uh, set daily goals. Hopefully I answer this correctly, uh, but set daily goals. Uh, make sure you're, you know, I'm an advocate for getting up in the morning and saying, hey, what type of energy am I going to bring and, and stuff like that. And, you know, high performance and, and what, what you guys are doing as athletes is, is you know, it's hard work. And, and I understand it's supposed to be fun and 100% it's supposed to be fun. But it's also hard work and why it's hard work is because there's passion to it and things that we're passionate about usually take hard work and and so you know if, if you really want to invest in yourself and i don't care where where what you decide to do whether you become a pga or lpga player or university player whatever you do in your life if you learn how to invest into your internal process right now you're going to be able to carry it on to being a lawyer to a vet to a doctor to a teacher and I truly believe in that. So set up a routine and make sure, you know, like I said at the start, my job is, is, is to make my athletes, make my athletes better and, and to create a perspective. And that's what we do. Um, is your mental game more important than your physical game? I, I think at a certain degree, uh, I think at a certain level it is. When, once you hit into that 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, so provincial, national, collegiate professional yeah your mental game is more important than the physical game but you can't have your physical game go downhill either and and so you have to use all pillars so your mental pillar your 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 off course conditioning your environment that you're creating for yourself your technical pillar we all we all work in 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 combination with each other Uh, while waiting for your shot, slow play, what is your good strategy? Stay away from your ball, number one. So don't get all – so this is tricky because I, I know there's marshals on the course, but my philosophy is – so if your ball if your ball is here and you usually go here when you're about to start your pre-shot, then step five feet back with your bag so that your pre-shot routine starts when you put your bag down beside your ball. Don't go up, put your bag down, then wait there for 15 minutes with your bag sitting beside the ball. Because what that's going to do is that's going to re kind of reignite and reset yourself, right? So put it, stay not a whole far away back, because I understand there's marshals and pace of play and stuff like that. But stay back two feet and put your bag back. And then when it's getting close, now you go up and put your bag down and start your process right away, right? I, I think that's one of the number one things. And the second thing is, is don't overanalyze when you're at the ball, right? So that's where the stress ball, the tennis ball, talking to your playing partners, if they want to talk, you can't control if they want to talk, but doing something, right? You know, in your, in your uh, scoring, you know, your scoring book, you know, trick, go as far as having a crossword puzzle that you can spend time doing something instead of just sitting there waiting for the shot. I'm an advocate. I have a crossword puzzle in my bag if I have to wait at times for a shot right? It just, it just gets you out of the normal. And then when you're ready, take your bag, the two feet you need to take it, put it down, start your process then, right? The last thing with that, don't go through your process and then wait. Your process starts when priming your focus starts when you're about to hit the shot. And I see a lot of amateur golfers go through everything, then wait 10 minutes to hit the shot or five minutes to hit the shot. Don't, don't do any of your pre-shot routine until put your bag down and you can move into it. Uh, yes, you can. Yeah, you can leave whenever you want. Uh, what's the best way to adjust uh, your feelings while playing a hole and finding out? So, yeah, tough for sure. I mean, it happens at every level. Uh, you know, golf is one of the only few sports that you can call a penalty on yourself. Um, but once again, your breathing, your resetting, your self-talk, your, your visualization, you play, you, even with all that, you still see a lot of golfers who've made a mistake and go on and do very well in the tournament. So, you know, I think you have to own it. Don't suppress those feelings. Be mad, be upset at yourself. 
but say, hey, in the next hour or in the next, if you have to go out and play in a playoff in the next 13 minutes, here's my plan. Here's what I'm going to aspire to do. And I think sometimes when those things happen, we tend to sit on that negative and, and God bless your parents. They, they love you to death, but they jump on the negative train as well. And, and the number one thing you need to do is make sure you get off the negative train. And so give yourself time to be upset. And then at some point in time, set the goal of here's my new tasks moving forward. Uh, staying positive during the round. Hey, at the end of the day, I'm not sitting here saying everything's rainbows and, and unicorns and everything's great. There's a lot of tough moments during a golf game. But if your self-talk can help you, that's the number one thing. Self-talk is everything. Your I am, I will statements, your breathing, uh, that's how you stay optimistic or positive during a round. And if you, the way you create strong self-talk is going back to your identity and knowing what you're about. Because that's what you have to remind yourself when you're having a tough time during a round. Because the outcomes can really chip away some of, some of your self-esteem for sure. Great stuff. All right. By all means, if there's anything I can do, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, if you, if you want to take this another step forward, take a look at that uh, uh, six-week plan, uh, and I'd be more than happy to, to work with you as we get prepared for, for the season for sure. So take care of yourselves, be safe, and, and I appreciate you stepping into these, uh, these webinars over the last few weeks. prices and I would